Matthew mentioned Alton Reed, uh, who is uh, um, uh, one of our uh, early, modern, uh, uh, early career researchers uh, here, and he's been talking to you today about the Mako and the politics of it. Thank you very much, Anna. I'd like to say congratulations to Anna, who actually passed her uh, PhD via the yesterday, so oh. congratulations. <laughs> <Dr. Jacobs. laughs> Happy to say. Um, thank you ever so much for coming. It's a delight to see so many people here on an October, dreary October morning, so thank you very much. And I would like to extend my gratitude to Anna um, and also the um, uh, Festival of Ideas team. They've done a fantastic job with putting this all on and actually promoting the event as well. And this is evidence with so many of you being here, so thank you. I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes um, and then we're going to have 10 minutes for any questions that you might have. I'll also hang around afterwards, so if you want to sort of grab me and then have a chat, then I'm more than welcome to, to talk about flamenco afterwards. So the theme for this festival, as you may well be aware, is power and resistance. Now this resonates with many of the things that ethnomusicologists think about. And ethnomusicology is the discipline, that, uh, the academic discipline that I belong to. Broadly speaking, ethnomusicology is the study of music in its cultural context or we might say the study of people making music. So we're not simply interested in music as a form of entertainment, we're interested in what music means for the people who perform it and listen to it, and also what music means and how it might reflect other social, cultural, and political issues. Now when it comes to this relationship between music, power, and resistance, a number of questions might arise. We might think of the ways in which regimes or governmental institutions use music to put forward a particular ideological position. We might also think of the ways in which music is used to challenge or to resist power structures through political protests, and that's one of the things we're going to be looking at with flamenco. We might also see how music can be used to promote the rights and identity of minority groups who lack power in certain social contexts. These sorts of questions are of great interest to ethnomusicologists, and so that's why I really wanted to put something forward for this particular festival. Now, Flamenco, I believe, is a really good example for exploring these sorts of issues. This might not seem immediately obvious. If any of you have any sort of idea of Flamenco, you probably have the typical stereotypes of dark-haired, gypsy female dancers and passion, fire, sun, sand and sangria in southern Spain. You're probably thinking of an image such as this might come to mind when you think of flamenco. However, the following image is probably not what would come to mind when you think of flamenco. I have to give a little warning here. This is a potentially controversial image, um, so if you're easily offended, do please close your eyes. So this sort of image you would not associate necessarily with flamenco. Now, this image comes from a protest group that we're going to be looking at as a case study. Um, this is a group that uses flamenco as a political weapon, we might say, in certain contexts. She has written on her chest, Death for Capitalism. It's an anti-capitalist group, quite clearly. And we'll be looking at the ways in which flamenco can be used to that capacity. The CD I was playing rather subtly in the background actually came from a singer, Juan Panilla, who I know in Granada. And he also uses flamenco as a political tool. So all the lyrics in that CD have some sort of resonance with political or ideological issues. So flamenco then has a lesser known side to it, a side that is in service, we might say, of social activism and political protest, a side that attempts to resist power structures. In this talk, we're going to look at two particular case studies. So one is this protest group that relates to the picture I've just shown you. And another one is a production that uses flamenco as a form of intercultural dialogue and also as a way of critiquing negative attitudes towards immigration in Spain. And this is, of course, a very pertinent topic for what we're seeing now with the crisis in Europe. Now, I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll not only think differently about flamenco, but also about music about the power of music, not merely as a form of entertainment, but also as a way that human beings negotiate their social worlds. Now, before I go into these two particular case studies, I'm just going to give a very brief overview to flamenco, where it comes from, a bit of its history. For those of you who, I imagine, have next to no knowledge at all of flamenco, or you might, um, in which case you may know this already. 
So flamenco is a music and dance tradition that primarily comes from southern Spain, from the region of Andalusia. Now this is a map of Spain as it stands now. Spain was decentralised in the late 1970s, early 80s into 17 autonomous communities that all have their relative degrees of power and cultural sort of identity. Flamenco is predominantly associated with Andalusia. There are also influences in Extremadura, in Murcia, and there's large flamenco communities in Madrid and Catalonia. But predominantly, Andalusia is seen as a sort of homeland for flamenco. The tradition is made up of three performance mediums. So, of course, dance is the most internationally recognised, the one that would probably spring to mind. The guitar also plays a fundamental role, um, not only as an accompanying instrument, but also as a solo instrument. Song, as well, is perhaps the most important thing, and people don't necessarily recognise this, that for many fans, for many artists, song is actually seen to be the, 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 the central aspect of flamenco artistry from which everything else emerges. Now, the origins of flamenco are something of a bit of a mystery, and of course, as with any of these things, they're a subject of great debate. I could talk for hours, which would be probably quite boring for you and very not very productive. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of some of the things that are perhaps more relevant to this talk. Now, in reality, it might surprise you to know that flamenco is actually a relatively recent tradition as a consolidated genre of music and dance. This really emerged in the mid-19th century um, in performance contexts in, in commercial theatres that were known as cafes cantantes. However, of course, nothing, a musical tradition doesn't spring from anywhere. <laughs> and a lot of the early song styles, a lot of the musical traditions that, that fed into flamenco, we might say, come back from much, much, uh, go back much, much further. Flamenco really is an amalgamation of a whole range of different cult cultural influences that we can find, particularly throughout southern Spain's history, from Phoenicians, Romans, Byzantines, Visigoths, and so on. But the most fundamental aspect that many people believe led into the development of flamenco is the Islamic occupation of Spain, which stretched from 711 till 1492. We'll be talking a bit more about this later. But it's believed that the an Arabic presence within Spain left a mark on the development of flamenco and that the tradition today can sort of gives traces to this history. But also during the Islamic occupation of Spain, we had a number of Sephardic Jews who lived there. They were expelled in 1492 after the Catholic reconquest, but they too, people argue, have left a mark, a legacy on flamenco artistry. But the most important group, perhaps, are the gypsies, or gitanos, as it's said in Spanish, that arrived in around the 15th, 16th century, and they are believed to have been one of the most important groups for forming flamenco as an artistic tradition. But we also need to take into account other lower underclass Andalusian, uh, lower class, sorry, Andalusian groups. For example, miners in East Andalusia and into Murcia. Another argument that's becoming sort of more popular in research is that sub-Saharan African slaves actually played an influence on the development of flamenco. This was because West Andalusia was the sort of point of exit for Spanish colonialism into, the cent cent into Central America and South America. And the idea is that many African slaves lived in these parts of West Andalusia and they went forwards and backwards to South America, and that this too may have in some way fed in to the development of flamenco. So in some, really, it's an amalgamation of different cultural influences. But a unifying factor is that flamenco was really born amongst marginalised, lower socio-economic groups as a way of confronting social woe. So in a sense, flamenco's always had a sort of political sign to it. In the late 18th century, we start to see some of the early song styles appearing. And some of these lyrics very often dealt with themes of poverty, of social marginalisation, of harsh working condi conditions, and so on. But it wasn't until the 19th century that flamenco really became more of a popular, we might say, commercial tradition across Spain. 
Now, this was partly because of European romanticism. So this is where people were in search of the exotic, they were in search of the so-called primitive and what have you, the oriental. Many intellectuals, travel writers, poets, composers from other parts of Spain, but also from other countries in Europe, travelled to southern Spain where they found gypsies, they found Islamic architecture, they found seemingly oriental styles of performance such as early flamenco. And this fed into the sort, to a sort of popularised, romanticised image of flamenco that also fed in to a popularised, romanticised image of Spain. And actually, much of the associations that we, that we put on flamenco come from this period. So flamenco gained its popularity across Spain, almost as an emblem of Spanish national culture. But flamenco was also claimed by Andalusian regionalists. So these were people who wanted more power for Andalusia. They wanted more cultural recognition for Andalusia. So towards the late 19th century, early 20th century, flamenco was sort of taken again as, as, a, as a symbol of Andalusian regional identity as well. However, with the outbreak of the Civil War in 1936 and the Franco regime in 1939, Flamenco was really sort of consolidated as something truly Spanish. Now this was because under the Franco regime, any sort of cultural regional diversity was highly suppressed. So regional languages, like in Catalonia or the Basque Country, or regional cultural traditions were not either suppressed or in some way morphed to be something Spanish rather than regional. And Flamenco was one of these traditions. In the late, when Franco died in 1975, in 1978 we moved to the so-called transition to democracy in Spain. And this was when Spain started to decentralise into these 17 autonomous regions. From that point on, Flamenco became much more of a global tradition, much more on the back of the world music industry, we might say. And also, because Andalusia had gained its autonomy, it also started to become a symbol of regional identity again, within Andalusia, which it couldn't have done during the Franco regime. Nowadays, people often see flamenco as a somewhat politically neutral tradition, that it's more associated with tourism or with the commercial industry or with Andalusian identity. However, in recent years, dramatic social, cultural, economic and political changes in Spain have led to this new politically recharged form of flamenco, we might say. And we're now going to move to a particular case study that I want to focus on for the next few minutes. So this is a, gro a group called Flow 6x8. Flow is a shorthand for flamenco. 6x8 is a rhythmic structure that's often used in flamenco performance. So this is a flash mob group, um, meaning that they engage in... A flash mob is a group that engages in performances. It could be music, it could be theatre, in a public setting usually for some sort of promotional purposes, but also increasingly for political, uh, the purposes of political protest, and then they'll quickly <coughs> disperse again. Now, this particular group began in 2008, but they gained a lot more popularity following the so-called 15th of May, or the Indignados movement in Spain. So I just saw error message up there. Let's just get rid of this, so I can see that you can't. Okay, so the group became a lot more popular, a lot more prominent on the back of this movement. So indignados means the outraged people, effectively. So this was a movement that began in 2011. It was a huge political movement that swept across the whole of Spain, with around about 8 million people being engaged in it. It's ongoing, really, but it was more prominent back then. And it was a movement that was essentially against austerity, it was in reaction to high levels of unemployment, the banking crisis that had swept across Europe and particularly had affected Spain very, very badly. They were against economic disparities, the dominance of a two-party political system, and so on and so forth. Now, Flow, six by eight, the flash group, uh, flash mob group, I'm going to call them Flow, it's a bit easier. They came out of this particular movement. And from this movement, they started to 
organise and choreograph performances, particularly in banks and even in the Andalusian parliament. They suitably called these performances acciones, which basically means actions, given a sort of an idea of political momentum, political attack, you might say. These acciones are filmed and uploaded onto YouTube and also onto the, the movement's own website. And their central message is, of course, anti-capitalist. It's against socio-economic inequalities in Spain and political corruption. They challenge neoliberal policies, such as privatisation, austerity, reductions in government spending and so on, that attempt to strengthen the private sector that many people believe have led to higher levels of unemployment, that have led to the sort of intense austerity policies that countries such as Spain have arguably suffered from. So this is the context in which we need to understand this particular group and where they're coming from. So I'm now going to focus on two examples. So you can see the ways in which the group actually puts forward their political message. Right, so this is the first one. So this is a performance in a bank, in BBVA. Um, I'm not going to translate any of it because I believe there's subtitles here. And we'll look at the lyrics at the end. I just want you to sort of get an idea of the performance and, and what this group does. So there you go. So that gives you an idea of the sorts of performances that this group is involved in. I'm sorry for this portion of the room, because you can't, I'm in the way of the screen. It's quite difficult. <laughs> um, so this little bit of text at the end gives the sort of context for this particular protest group. So I'll just translate this for you. So the main Spanish bankers, pressurised by the international banking system, demanded the Spanish government in May 2012 the rescue of Bankia with European funds. So Bankia is a Spanish conglomerate. Since then, in Spain, we are captives of the Troika. So the Troika, you may have come across, is a sort of rather derogatory term that's used to refer to three institutions that have been responsible in Europe 
for the banking bailouts and then the implementation of austerity policies in countries like Spain, in countries like Greece and so on. Um, this is the International Monetary Fund, European Commission, European Central Bank. Now, the bailout for Bankia superseded 20 billion euros. So this was the largest one in Spanish history for a single bank. And it was also part of a larger bailout package that came from Europe that was around about 120 billion or in, in excess of 120 billion. So the performance clearly is critiquing this particular event that occurred um, and the general European involvement in economic policies and the sorts of austerity measures that have been implemented as a result and the high levels of unemployment within the country. Now the lyrics are also very carefully written um, to reflect this central message. Let's get that to these. Now I have to thank my Spanish teacher Pablo, who's just out over there, um, because some of, the, some of the metaphors in here are actually quite complicated to get through, so he helped me with, with some of the translations, so thank you. Um, so the song is Four Swindlers, which really, the Four Swindlers we think refers to the three main banks in Spain, BBVA, Santander, um, Bankia, and probably the Spanish Parliament as well. Um, now the lyrics here are quite significant. To more than 20 billion, 20 billion went to Bankia. Pots and stones would shake throughout Spain. So this is refer referring to the idea of austerity and the sorts of effects that that may well have on day-to-day -day living in Spain. No hospitals, refuge, where shall I shelter? If until the day I die, I owe them everything. Money, why do you need more money? They'll be buried but with their pockets <coughs> full. They, all, they are my four swindlers with striped suits. They lurk in the shadows and not on the beach. This was quite hard to translate. <laughs> um, basically, I think is the idea that they're, they're sort of in the darker side of society, that they're, they're in the background doing dodgy deals and not being transparent, perhaps. Don't ask for my forgiveness because there is none. And PP and Pesoy love the bankers. Now, this last lyric, this last line, is a direct attack on the political establishment. So PP, Partido Popular, the popular party, is a centre-right, effectively the Conservatives, that are in power in the, in the Spanish central government. PSOE is a centre-left, the Spanish Workers' Party, effectively like Labour, that are in power in the regional government in Andalusia. Now the group here is critiquing the, the political establishment and the idea that these two groups, the centre ground in politics, can't be distinguished anymore. And, and uh, we can resonate with that in the UK. There's been similar criticisms as well. Um, and they argue that the two parties are sort of engaging in the same austerity policies that are, that are having negative effects due to the banking crisis, that are having negative effects on um, Spanish day-to-day -day living. Now, this doesn't come out of anywhere. This reflects a general trend, a general fragmentation of politics, not only in Spain and Andalusia, but also in other parts of Europe. In Andalusia, in 2015, in the regional, this year, in the regional elections, PP, the Conservative Party, lost quite a lot of power. They normally do, but they've lost even more. PSOE, who have been in power since the 1980s, have lost power as well. They still are in power. But a new party emerged called Podemos, which means we can. This is effectively an anti-austerity party that grew directly out of the 15th of May protest movements in 2011 that I mentioned earlier. So this was a political party that grew out of a grassroots movement and that are now sort of showing their face on the Spanish political scene. They've gained quite immense popularity over the short number of years that they've actually been going. So this is what this song is reflecting. This is, this is how this song is sort of fitting into the wider social context. In June 2014, <coughs> Flo stepped it up a gear and took their performances to the public gallery of the Andalusian Parliament. So I just want to show you this particular video.
This is edited, by the way, quite clearly. I'd love to see that happen in the UK House of Parliament. I mean, that really livened things up a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. So this gives you an idea, then, of that particular performance. Um, now, the key issue here, of course, of this particular protest are the levels of poverty and unemployment that have arisen as a result of some of these policies that have in, been implemented that were critiqued in the other video. Now, the first lyric here is quite significant. Begging on my knees is how you like to see me, or emigrating, begging for a shit job while you indulge in dodgy deals. You are lackeys of the Troika, again, that sl 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 uh, attack, we say, on, on, on European institutions. Now, Flo, in this particular video, are really trying to bring their critique back to the regional level and the problems that are facing in Andalusia. Now, there isn't an overestimate here. The levels of Poverty and unemployment in Andalusia are highly significant. It's, it's the poorest region, or one of the poorest regions in Europe, and it has one of the highest levels of unemployment in Europe. So this isn't just being overestimated. There are genuine issues here that this group is commenting on. And many <coughs> trained doctors, lawyers, nurses, and so on, need to, well, they get bad jobs, as she says in the video clearly, um, as waiters, or well, not to say bad jobs, but jobs they may not be trained for as waiters, as waitresses, bartenders, so on, or many do emigrate. And the levels of emigration, particularly from southern Spain, are quite significant, particularly in recent years. Now, one of my colleagues, um, Joshua Brown, who works in the United States, he's worked significantly with this particular group, more than I have, uh, but he's been very, very helpful in, in helping me with some of the research for this. So I wanted to put in a reference to his work. So he states, an anti-capitalist stance is no longer considered radical in Andalusia due to the inordinate amount of pain and misery that the free market system has caused its people. Now this might sound a little strong, and I'm sure that many Andalusians simply don't agree with this statement, and I'm sure that many Andalusians don't agree with the actions of this particular group. But it does illustrate the context in which we need to understand flow 6x8. They're not simply a peripheral anarchist, anti-establishment group, but they do actually reflect a growing public opinion in Andalusia that challenges the status quo and that challenges current economic, political systems of power. The group is also interesting because it forces us to think a little differently about flamenco. So lyrics are, are of course, the main way, you, you might think, that, that the political message is being put across. But the message is also being put forward through the flamenco body. So we might say that the body in this performance is a site of resistance. So Flo uses the body predominantly through dance, but also through the song, to claim these controlled so-called capitalist spaces, such as banks. They're defying the usual social norms and behaviours that we might associate with these particular settings. So the message of the performances is conveyed in the actual places that the group intends to critique. They directly challenge and resist economic, political structures of power in the places that those structures of power are created, in the banks, if that makes any sense, <laughs> in the banks and um, in the parliament. Now, the use of the body also serves another purpose. It challenges typical stereotypes of femininity in flamenco. Now, as I mentioned earlier, flamenco is normally associated with a sort of uh, quite exotic, seductive, passionate image of a female dancer quite often. There are male dancers, of course, but this is the sort of alluring image that tends to dominate in representations of flamenco. But in this particular performance, the dancer is a powerful political figure that breaks with these usual exotic stereotypes that we might associate 
with flamenco. And this is significant because Andalusia traditionally is quite a patriarchal society. But ultimately, Flow 6x8 want to repoliticize uh, re flamenco, to break from its usual stereotypes, to bring back its political potential that there was during the Franco regime when some people used flamenco to contest the Franco regime, to try to bring it back to its origins where it came from sort of lower socio-economic groups. This is their ultimate aim. They believe that the institutional development of flamenco, particularly in Andalusia since the 1980s, has in a sense sanitised it. So its relationship to tourism and the commercial industry have made it more of a sort of cultural commodity, we might say, that's part of the broader economic system. They want to sort of try to bring back a political edge to flamenco. However, in the last year, the activities of the group actually seem to have ceased, at least for, as far as I can tell. Their last performance was in the end of 2014, I believe, at a university. Now, this may largely be because of a new gag law that was introduced in Spain in 2015. As a response to the growing sort of political protests that, we've, that I've mentioned from 2011, the government now, in theory, can prosecute unlicensed demonstrations, protests online, and disrespect to the police. So, for example, a man was recently fined because he called his local police force lazy on the Facebook. So the UN have criticised this as being against human rights and freedom of speech, and some people compare this to the sorts of censorships that we may have seen in the Franco regime. So it's quite a controversial policy that has been included, and it seems that it's had an effect on the activities of this group. So quite how they will continue their message remains to be seen. So now I want to move to the second case study. Now, another issue that Spain faces, and of course the whole of Europe, and perhaps the most challenging issue for Europe today, is of course the migrant crisis. Flamenco, too, has been used as a tool for challenging negative social attitudes towards immigration, drawing on its history to try to promote a sense of intercultural dialogue. Now, before I look at the case study, I want to sort of give a bit of context here, because it's quite a complicated scenario, so I'm going to give a bit of context to immigration and also to the historical relevance of flamenco. So Spain is a gateway to Europe and therefore has experienced dramatic, uh, a dramatic increase in the arrival of people, of course, who are escaping poverty, who are escaping regimes or war, or people simply who are seeking a better life due to dire economic circumstances. And like other European countries, people often need to make quite treacherous journeys in order to reach Spain. And many, many people have lost their lives in the Strait of Gibraltar, which goes from North Africa to to southern Spain. Now the numbers in the Spanish context are relatively small when we compare them to Greece, to Italy, to Eastern Europe and so on. However, immigration from Morocco and from other African countries has been quite prominent since the 1980s and it became particularly prominent in Spain from the 1990s and into the 2000s. Now as a result, a number of researchers have sort of started to say, well, there are raisi, rising sorry, racial tensions now in Spain, xenophobia and also Islamophobia, particularly in areas or communities where there's, large Morocco, uh, where there's large communities of Moroccan immigrants in places such as Andalusia. And of course, we're seeing a similar situation, a similar rise in these tensions across Europe. But a factor that distinguishes Spain from other countries in Europe is its own history, particularly when it comes to how Spain has dealt with um, Moroccan or Muslim immigrants. And this relates to Spain's Islamic past that I mentioned earlier. Now, Spanish, uh, Islamic occupation in Spain stretched from 711 till 1492. This is a very cooked tour again of the history. This is referred to as Al-Andalus, which was the territory that were not only parts of Spain, but also um, Portugal, the territory that were under Islamic occupation. In reality, Al-Andalus only actually lasted until the early 11th century. Following that, Islamic occupation was sort of broken down into smaller kingdoms that gradually lost more power as Catholics pressed back against those territories. The history is hugely complex, um, but this is the rough sort of 
era, the era that we're talking about. Now, Spanish historians, media representations, and educational narratives have often constructed, we might say, conflicting versions of this particular history. And I want to concentrate on two sorts of constructions of this history. The first is the idea that Spain was invaded by Islam in 711 that effectively ruptured with Spanish history, that effectively ruptured with the formation of a Spanish national identity. The Catholic reconquest then in 1492 was the final stage that unified Spain, effectively. Now this was a narrative that was quite common during the Franco regime in trying to create the idea of a unified Spanish history. And in this idea of the unified Spanish history, the Islamic period doesn't play a part. So in this narrative, Islamic, the Islamic history of Spain is effectively sort of erased as being influential on Spanish identity. Nowadays, some people, some, amongst some quarters in Spain, people are concerned that Moroccans, particularly, because it's the largest group, are invading again. Um, now, this has been made worse by some extreme Islamic groups who claim Spain as a lost territory that they should claim. So there's this kind of tension that's going on here. Now, as a result, Moroccans are sometimes referred to as invading Moors. Now, you may have heard the word Moor before. Moor is a historical term to refer to Arabs and Berbers from North Africa who, who occupy Spain from the 8th century. It has derogatory connotations as well, of sort of the idea of a barbaric, um, savage, Arab or Berber attacking and, and taking over Spain. So it has quite negative connotations. But now the word more is sometimes <coughs> being collapsed into modern day representations of Moroccans. And I'll give you an example. There's a phrase called, no hay moros en la costa, there's no moors on the coast. This is basically a phrase saying, the coast is clear. You now often see um, phrases in graffiti, graffiti, it's even been used in media representations, Moros and La Costa, there are Moors on the coast. So the idea, the connotation here is that they're invading again. So it has quite sort of negative racial um, connotations. <coughs> However, an alternative version of this history actually embraces the Islamic period as a sort of an essential part of Spanish, and particularly an essential part of Andalusian regional identity, because a lot of the Islamic occupation was in the south of Spain, in Andalusia. Now, according to this narrative, the Islamic history shouldn't necessarily be shunned as being formative, but it's actually important to national identity, that Al-Andalus, this Islamic period, um, contributed to... European philosophy, European arts and sciences, and so on and so forth. There's also the idea of convivencia, which means coexistence. Now, this is the idea that Christians, Jews, and Muslims lived happily and in tolerance within Islamic Spain. The Arabized Christians within Islamic Spain, and not the Catholics who are in other parts of Spain. So, Arabized Christians, Jews, and Muslims lived together happily in Islamic Spain. Now, of course, it's far more complicated than that. Um, some people completely ridicule the idea and say that, well, no, there was no level of tolerance. It was an Islamic occupation and Jews and citizens were second class... Uh, sorry, Jews and Christians were second class citizens. Um, some people valorise it and say, yes, this was the most wonderful period in our history. Others take a more pragmatic view and say, yes, there were levels of tolerance, there were levels of social interactions, but there are also levels of resistance and violence and so on. Whatever the historical truth, this has become quite a powerful story, we might say, from modern-day multiculturalism almost in Spain, and particularly in Andalusia. And some educational programmes, historical foundations, and the tourism industry as well, play on this idea of coexistence in Islamic Spain as a sort of way of trying to promote dialogue, trying to represent a better image, we might say. But some argue that this is almost a bit of historical idealism, that convivencia is part of the past and that it's not actually made relevant for immigrants and communities in the present, that it's not part of social reality. It's simply used for tourism or for sort of representations of Andalusian identity. However, there are instances in which this history is being used at a more, we might say, grassroots level 
to try to promote dialogue, particularly between uh, Andalusian Spaniards and uh, Moroccans. And flamenco, I argue, is one way in which this is being achieved. So why then flamenco? What is it about flamenco in particular? Now, I mentioned earlier that flamenco is believed to have links to the Arabic past, that flamenco was born in a sense of intercultural dialogue between different groups. So that's one factor. But also people argue that flamenco has tangible similarities and that flamenco can trace, it, trace its heritage back to musical traditions that originated in Al-Andalus that now exist in North Africa, particularly in Morocco. So this is one of the arguments that comes through. Now, of course, to, to prove whether this is true is very, very difficult. Yes, there may be some similarities between the, two, between the different traditions, but it's very difficult to determine. It's very difficult to trace any form of her heritage. But in a sense, that doesn't matter. What is powerful is the actual notion that they're connected and what that can mean socially. As a result, some musicians, flamenco musicians, Moroccan musicians, have come together in sort of musical collaborations, which is often referred to as flamenco Andalusi. So this is mixing flamenco with the musical traditions from Al-Andalus that now exist in Africa. And I'm going to play you a very short example because I'm running out of time, as usual, I've been talking for too long. Um, just so you get an idea. Now this comes from a Moroccan artist called Jalal Chakala. He's lived in, Moroc in, in Spain for many, many years. And he's very well known for engaging in these sorts of cross-cultural musical collaborations, we might say. So this is a brief example of flamenco mixed with traditions from Al Andalus. <laughs> Now sometimes, in a sense, this is seen then as a recombination of history. Now sometimes, I've, I've spoke to a lot of people about this, a lot of musicians and promoters and what have you, and some people see it as a bit of a forced connection, it's a bit sort of romantic, it's not really socially relevant. But actually there's contexts in which this collaboration is being used, again, like the political group that we looked earlier, to have a directly socially engaged purpose. And we're now going to look at a particular performance that was called Immigration, so immigration. Now, this was a show that actually started, to, uh, it was actually produced and performed in 2003, so it's relatively old now, but I think it's more pertinent today than it perhaps even was back in 2003, which is why I wanted to, wanted to bring it to this particular presentation. The show was produced by and directed and led by Angeles Gabaldon, who's a dancer, and her group. Um, and it was also broadcast online to over 50,000 people. And this was the first time that a flamenco <coughs> performance had had this. Uh, so it was broadcast in other parts of Spain, in, in the UK, in America, and various other countries, in, in South, America, South American countries as well. Now the message essentially of the show was the denunciation of human trafficking, of the deaths in the Mediterranean, that at this time in 2003 were more and more on the news in Spain, and also denun uh, denouncing the rises in racism that we were seeing in Spain. It was an attempt to critically engage with the debate here, to try to sort of raise awareness of the realities of immigration, and as a sense, try to promote some form of cultural tolerance. So how then was this message actually put across? Now, one of the significant factors of this show was that it actually featured a multiracial cast. Now, this is very rare in flamenco. Normally, flamenco performances are dominated by Spanish, even just Andalusian artists. This particular show featured Jalal Chikara, the Moroccan musician who I just showed you, people, other, people, other artists from North Africa, people from Japan, people from Brazil, people from France, people from the UK. It was a truly broad <coughs> sweep of different people were involved in, the different nationalities were involved in the performance. And ex it expressed the notion, we are all immigrants, which was one of the slogans that was kind of used for the show. 
Another important factor in this production was that it wasn't just using music and dance, it was also using video and striking images. I mean, the image we have here is particularly striking. This was the promotional image. So this is a shirt floating across the ocean that is meant to depict the deaths of migrants across the, uh, uh, in the Mediterranean as they're making the journey to Spain. They also included, the, the producers also included video footage into the performance as well. So we, there was archival footage of immigrants arriving into various parts of Spain. There was also their own footage that they filmed of broken boats that had washed up on the Andalusian shores that, of course, had come from, uh, from migrants who had, who had made the journey over to Andalusia. It's also important to note the narrative structure. I'm going to show you a, a, a bit in, in, in a minute. But it's also important to note the narrative structure of the, of the performance. This was more than just a music and dance performance. It was also a story. It was meant to show the different faces to immigration, to try to raise awareness. So we had scenes dealing with racism. We had uh, scenes dealing with sex work, which is unfortunately a job that many immigrants find themselves, many female immigrants find themselves falling into in Spain, particularly in cities such as Seville. So we tried to present the different faces to the crisis that in, um, specifically within Spain and Andalusia, but of course it can speak to global issues as well. The show also wanted to contrast the experience of Spanish emigration with Spanish immigration. So I'm just going to give you a quote here from the director. The Andalusian coasts are the port of arrival for people wanting to seek a new life for themselves, a better life, a job. We sought to contrast that reality with when the Andalusians were an emigrant people out of need, who during the 60s and 70s led a considerable exile both within Spain and abroad. So this is referring to the huge numbers, particularly who have left Andalusia from the 60s, 70s onwards and back into the history of Andalusia as well, and contrasting it with the reality that Andalusia is now facing. Um, or at least was at this time. But the final point, the final sort of most powerful message of this show was the way in which Flamenco and Lucy, this collaboration, was used to put forward a, a critical message. So I'm just going to show you now a couple of clips. And this is all available online, the whole production, so if you want to see it, it's not very good quality, but it is all available. Oh, yeah. time. So that gives you a brief idea of, of the performance. So this particular scene was called rechazo, which means rejection. So we've got here three dancers. Two, we assume, are Spanish and one, a North African in a North African immigrant in Spain. And he's been brought into the circle only to be cast out again, and pushed away at various points. So the sort of racial tensions are being depicted through the dance choreography itself. The lyrics are also highly significant. You aren't like us, they told me at the bar. I replied, thank God, no two people are ever the same. Now these lyrics are sung in Spanish and then they're replicated in Arabic, as you just heard, by Jalal Chakara, this particular mu uh, musician. And they're replicated in a vocal style that is believed to have its heritage in Islamic Spain. So again, here this recombination of the two styles, of the past and present, you might say, is being used for a more critical purpose, a way of raising, um, raising awareness of the issues surrounding immigration and trying to promote tolerance. 
Now, since 2003, the situation, of course, has worsened. We're seeing greater levels of migration, more deaths, greater racism, and the rise of the far right and what have you across Europe and in Spain as well. But in this context, in recent years, there's actually been an increase in collaborations between Spanish musicians and Moroccan musicians. And that forms the crux of my research now, to look at these performances, how they're put together, what they mean for the different performers, how they're going about doing their day-to-day -day music, in, we might say, and what it means for modern-day immigration in Andalusia. As an ethnomusicologist, I sincerely believe in music's potential for social activism and for the promotion of equality and tolerance, and I hope that these two examples have illustrated that point. Music can give power to the powerless and voice to the voiceless in a world that is characterised by continued inequalities. Thank you very much. showing them where they're getting shepherded out of the bank by security. Um, so clearly there are instances. Some of them are edited, so it's quite difficult to sort of determine exactly at what point they may well have been thrown out, because the videos are edited. In certain instances like this one, they, are, they do what they do and then they leave, and the banks need to go about their, their business. They gain quite a lot of press coverage and popularity, so I suspect that in a certain sense, the banks... If they saw it happening, they, they were probably already aware of it, and they may well have been prepped to say, just let them leave. And that's a hunch. I don't know whether that's true. Um, but that, that's a hunch. That they just let it happen, and then, yeah. But in the initial stages, they were being shepherded out, and you can find videos of that. It's quite, quite interesting to watch. answer this in any depth would probably take me ages, maybe we should chat afterwards, but just to respond to it quickly. Um, so this idea of duende, so just for those who, who aren't aware, duende is kind of a, it's an aesthetic, something that people are trying to search for in flanker performance, the sort of ephemeral quality of a truly authentic, fantastic performance, it's almost spiritual in a sense that people are kind of aim for. Now, you speak to a lot of artists and they kind of rubbish the idea of Duende. We need to bear in mind that Duende was actually developed partly on the back of um, Federico García Lorca and his writings um, in the early 20th century. He sort of popularised the idea of Duende. But what I think you're getting at, which is ex completely correct, is this idea of fatalism, of, of, of sort of confronting your social woes. And Fomenko was born, as I mentioned at one point during this, and this is something that the group's trying to sort of resonate with, was born amongst lower groups, lower socioeconomic groups, in quite discrete, we might say, local settings. There was no sort of overtly political purpose at that stage. Later on, Flamenco started to be patronised by the so-called senoritos, who were sort of the intellectual elite 
um, the higher classes in, in, in Andalusia. Andalusia, way into the 19th, even into the 20th century, had a hugely feudal structure of the have-nots and the have and the haves. And senoritos started to patronise certain flamenco events that paved the way for its popularity eventually. But you're completely correct. It was born in the sort of smaller context of a way of sort of confronting social woes, of trying to sort of tie together a relatively small community. This group is bouncing off that, but making it more overt, making it more politically active. You know. So I hope that answers your question. But we can talk yeah, more about this afterwards. A similar movement in uh, Greece is, uh, I think, Rembetica. Yeah, Rembetica. Yeah, I don't know about what, where it's been used for a political purpose. Well, it's political really? Purpose. Okay, that's it's interesting. A, a movement in the 1930s again amongst the small people. Mm. And it's known as the Greek Blues in the way mm. that yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. But, but there's been a huge revival in the last uh, 10, 15 mm. years that it's become more political. Interesting. Inside. Oh, that would be interesting if you could tell me more about that afterwards. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah, you're quite right. And there are still those sorts of contexts that you do need to seek out, so to speak, in flamenco. There's uh, one that pops to mind is the, the Peña, which is a flamenco club. Um, these were established in the late 40s, uh, 1950s during the Franco regime as sort of contexts specifically for the enjoyment of traditional orthodox, we might say, um, flamenco. And Partly because a lot of the context for flamenco, the, lot of the more sort of local, private context or bars that have been associated with flamenco, that have been associated with revolution in the early, during the, during the Republican era, during the Civil War, and in the early stages of the Franco regime, they were shut down by the regime. And so other sort of contexts sprung <coughs> up in their, in their place, and the Peñas is one of them. And you can still find those in Spain. There's a whole number of them. They're quite hard to get into often. But they're those sorts of almost backstreet performances that you can find that are still there. With the what movement, sorry? Anti-eviction movement. Anti-eviction? Yes. Okay. That was, I think, really important for that as well. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. That's where, like, the political space, mm -hmm. so the idea of the body, like, being the body of the state, mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Yeah, because there have been other performances in them, not just this group. So, the, an anti eviction, so did this anti eviction movement prop up, uh, pop up at the same time as the, the 2011 Lee Indignado movement? Uh, okay, that's interesting now. Thank you for that. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Um, then, uh, just for two kids, mm -hmm. um, the idea of emancipation, obviously, the freedom is traditional, the fleas, um, the idea of migration and traveling from one country to another was quite present. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yeah, there's... Absolutely. I mean, there's so much that I could go into in, into this. And actually, it's good you pick up on that, the, the, the lyrics of immigration, emigration. One of the... Um, uh, the opening scene in this particular show um, has the group of dancers together. They're at a New Year's party. You only find out until they turn on the radio that they're in a New Year's, New Year's Eve party in Germany. Now, this is, of course, reflecting the huge numbers of Andalusians who went to Germany during the 1950s, 1960s, and so on. And Juanito Baldarrama, who was a Coppola singer, um, so not flamenco, he was a flamenco singer, but he became more popular in a slightly different style of, of, of flamenco that's called Coppola. Um, there's a popular music uh, tradition in, in, in Spain. And he became very popular during the regime, 
Um, and one of his songs was El Emigrante, the emigrant, that exactly resonated with these issues of the huge numbers of people who were leaving. This was written in 1949, I believe. So you're quite right, and, and that sort of connection with the lyrics is picked up upon in the show as well. So thank you. <laughs> 